and that's chapter um, 10. And I'll ask you to start reading chapter 10. And we'll have, I'll have the notes for next time. You don't have the thing for that. So you'll have to listen. But we'll have these notes so will be available next time. So you can just see what we're doing. Yeah, and what chapter 10 is, is it's a little bit of a change. We've talked now about uh, p p diffusion control electrochemistry. We've talked about convective electrochemistry. We've talked very, uh, mu uh, very much about kinetic effects, especially on diffusion control chemistry. And almost all of the experiments that we talked about were for a fairly specific purpose, and that was to do either analytical methods or for actually studying kinetics of electrode reactions. In this next chapter, we're going to really talk about using electrochemistry in a different way entirely. And that's using it to do, well, in some cases for kinetic analysis again, but also to study what happens when we use electrochemistry to do synthetic type manipulations. In other words, use electrochemistry to make bulk changes in concentrations. So in order to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to really do concentrate on chapter 10, but we're going to use a little bit of the ideas of chapter 7, which we don't really have as listed as an official topic. But I'm going to summarize some of the important points of chapter 7 here as we talk about it in chapter 10. So let's start with chapter 10 as a heading. And the idea is we're going to talk about constant current, which is some of chapter seven, and what they call bulk electrolysis methods. Before, when we did electrolysis experiments, we often assumed that the amount of electrolysis was minimal so that the bulk concentration never changed from the beginning to the end of the experiment. In this chapter, we're going to talk about experiments in which that is not the case, definitely not the case. In fact, the goal will be to electrolyze significant fractions of the concentration or the amount of species that's in there. So either from effectively one uh, bulk concentration to close to zero bulk concentration. Let's talk about stuff in, uh, in chapter seven first, and let's talk about a constant or controlled current methods. These types of measurements are often called galvanostatic. rather than potentiostatic. Galvanostatic means we're going to control the, poten uh, control the current and measure, typically measure potentials. And so we call them galvanostatic or sometimes people will call them chrono potentiometric. The idea here is to usually get current or potential time curves. Rather than current time curves, we're going to get potential time curves or perhaps um, potential current curves. And uh, as the name implies, rather than a potentiostat, we use a galvanostat to do our experiment. And the galvanostat, it operates in analogy to a potentiostat. A potentiostat maintains a constant potential at a working electrode. A galvanostat maintains a constant current at a working electrode. So. The idea would be you would have some sort of a power supply that would put out a constant amount of current. We could monitor that current. And we would apply that current between the auxiliary and working electrodes. And if you notice, we really don't need a reference electrode. We don't need it to maintain a, the current flow because once we've set this power supply up to supply a constant current, it doesn't really matter what the potential drop is across those two terminals. We'll just supply the amount of current necessary. But often a, a reference electrode is added in the circuit so that you can measure the potential between the working electrode and the reference electrode and that helps in your data interpretation. The reference electrode is not strictly needed, only there 
in many cases to measure the working electrode potential. Now there are methods to construct galvan constant current circuits, but we'll leave that for a little bit later. A simple method that you can, I think you should be able to understand is to use a high voltage set of batteries. And you used to be able to pretty easily buy high voltage batteries. You still can, they're a little bit harder to buy. You can always buy 90 volt batteries and stack them together. You can make like a 400 volt stack of uh, batteries. Of course, the batteries don't have a lot of capacity, but that's not really necessary. Then what you do is you put in a large value variable resistor here, maybe a few mega ohms or something like that that you can vary. And that is effectively your constant current source. By changing the value of the resistor, we can change the amount of current that flows through that circuit by the relationship uh, Ohm's law. And the reason we use a large value of the um, of the uh, voltage is that if we have, for example, it may require, and the, nice, the interesting thing about constant current source, suppose we want to put one microamp across our circuit. If our circuit has internally one mega ohm of resistance, suppose our load here is one mega ohm. Well, in order to put one microamp through that load, we have to supply one volt of driving force through that resistor. <coughs> and if this, is a, if this was a one volt battery, we would not be able to supply one volt through that load, no way. So what we want to do is a, supply a large excess amount of voltage so that we always have a, essentially a constant pressure on this thing. So if it's one volt or a tenth of a volt or 10 volts, essentially that amount of voltage really is essentially constant. So it's only a small fraction of the total. And that's, that's the reason for that. Uh, most modern ways use a electronics to maintain the potential no matter what. So, uh, but there's always a limit with this thing and that limit would be what they call a compliance voltage and it limits how much voltage you can actually force through the circuit. For example, if we wanted to put one milliamp through that one mega ohm resistor, that would require a thousand volts of potential. And we don't have that. So um, that, that we, we aren't gonna do that. We ain't, can't put one milliamp through that circuit. Only, but if the load was, uh, was one ohm, then we could easily put one milliamp through the circuit. So depending on our load and what we need, we have to have a different sort of power supply. Now chapter seven, we talk about chronal potentiometry. Starting out. And the idea of chronal potentiometry, like chronal amperometry, is you supply a step of current rather than a step of potential. So the idea is you would have your current time, and again, this is applied, not measured, and you would step from zero current to some value, starting at zero for the time. At the output, you would measure the working electrode potential. And the working electrode would have some equilibrium potential before the experiment starts. Since the current is zero, that's gonna be at the equilibrium potential. Then it would change and give a curve something like this, where then you get to this almost this asymptotic shape thing, and you measure this time here as tau, which is the, what they call the transition time. So that's one variant. They also they have a current reversal experiment where you would do a similar thing where you apply a current step and then uh, reverse that current at some time. And so the potential out would look not exactly this like this, but something like 
this and you would measure these two times Tf and tau sub r, you probably can't read that, but that's tau sub f, that's tau sub r. So what's going on in this particular experiment? What we're doing when we're looking at the potential here is we're essentially using the current as a titration of the species near the electrode surface. And by supplying a constant amount of current, we're forcing the electrode reaction to occur at a constant rate. And that's unlike the constant potential experiments we did before. When we applied a potential, the reaction occurred with a given rate constant, but it did not occur at a constant rate. It depended on the diffusion to supply the reaction. When we apply a constant current, we make the rate of the electrode reaction constant. Now then, so when we do that, what we're measuring then is the Nernst equation, in this case for a reversible electrode process, the potential that we measure is the Nernst electrode potential. And so let's kind of see if we can draw a little bit of a diagram to help us out. Here we have the possibility of having the bulk concentration of concentration at the electrode surface. And if we start from the electrode out, what's happening? Well, at time equals zero on our curve, the concentration at the electrode surface and in the bulk is the same throughout, just like before, correct? So we can draw that curve. As time increases a little bit, the profile now is gonna be somewhat different. What's happened now is we've <coughs> taken species O at a constant rate away from the electrode surface. We're electrolyzing at a constant rate. So we get this set of curves, if we look at constant intervals, are gonna go down at, at a constant rate. So we get these sorts of a set of curves as we go along our current pulse. What happens now, and this is the critical thing, what happens when the concentration of O becomes zero at the electrode interface? We've removed enough by our electrons that we've added or subtracted to make the concentration zero. Well, we can no longer rely on O to supply the amount of current that we're forcing through the system. Okay, we have to have current flow because we're forcing the current to flow through there. For the, a long time, we could rely on reduction of O to do that current. At this point, there's no more O that, that is allowed. So we have to move to a new potential for that reaction to occur. And what's that new potential? Well, that may be, for example, the potential at which we reduce the solvent. Because once we get to this point, O can no longer support the amount of current we required. So now we have to switch to a potential where say the solvent is reduced. So you can think of this sort of system. We've got O to R and then solvent. So if we look as a current time curve, our current potential curve, this is what it would look like. So as long as we're in this zone, we can have this, near this potential to do our reaction. As soon as we get rid of all the O, we have to switch to this potential out here to do the reaction. So that's why we get this transition feature. That potential increase is that switch of potential out to that particular point. But as long as we're in this region, we're just setting the potential at the Nernst equation. So you can see this is a little sigmoidal type shape and that's just this sort of potential along that current axis. 
And that's, a, that's one of the things that's a little bit different when you think, especially when you think about potentials, is thinking about currents. We're not, we, we're forcing the reaction to occur, so we have to do whatever it takes to get that current to flow through it. If there's no O to do that, we have to get something else to do that current uh, going. And so whatever potential we required is going to make that potential go. Now this is reversible. The only difference really for quasi-reversible situations is in a reversible case, the transition is fairly sharp. For quasi-reversible cases, the transition is drawn out and is less sharp. So a chronopotentiogram can be analyzed by the transition time and um, it also you can get some information about quasi-reversibility in the system that way. What you do to study the chemical processes is you can vary I applied and bulk concentration to study effects of chemical reactions and heterogeneous kinetics. And a, Equation for that would be the transition time to the one half power times the amount of current we've applied. Remember, this is the current we've applied, not the current that we measure. Uh, times the bulk concentrate or divided by the bulk concentration is equal to NFA d zero to the one half pi to the one half over two. And this is okay, this reaction works for all kinetics except for completely irreversible reactions because that transition is the same no matter what the kinetic values are. So th this is, a, is a, a, reasonable a reasonable equation for all values of K0. However, it's not any good if we have chemical reactions, if we have adsorption or double air charging, all of those things will affect those curves. This particularly unsettling is the effect of double air charging. Remember what double air charging is about. We have an electrode, a capacitor at the electrode surface. As we change the potential of the electrode surface, a charging current will flow. When the charging current flows, that means current is required to do that. So notice here, all during this experiment, the potential changes constantly. That means that the amount of charging current is changing constantly. Very difficult to disentangle the charging current that's flowing and the applied uh, and the current that's required to do the uh, overall process. <coughs> and so that's why we often have some trouble with chronopotentiometry, disentangling those two effects. And that's in fact why people really are not using chronopotentiometry. It's not a very useful method. In fact, if it was perfect, if we had no trouble, it would be great. It, you could do a lot of neat things with it, but in fact, there's so many experimental difficulties that people often don't use it. Uh, again, the current reversal method gives you some more information, but again, hardly anybody uses these anymore. Um, there was a brief interest in using chronopotentiometry when it was first developed, but it quickly died away. But the idea is still the same uh, for other things that we're doing. We need to know when we're doing these reactions, again, we, we, have, we can rely on this sort of idea. We're forcing current through, making the reaction occur. At some point, the reaction switches from the one reaction to another reaction, and we'll get a transition in the potential, and that transition will tell us something about the concentration of those species and perhaps something about the kinetics of those species. Okay.